it's very nice to be able to talk about this subject um, because it's uh, something that I've been working on for the last few years. Um, I'll be first put my hand up to say that working with transplant recipients and research in this field is, is, is relatively new to me, um, so this is, this is going to be the challenge for me. I think the challenge for you in this presentation is, is some of the concepts that are brought up might seem a bit on left field, as in a bit abstract, and, um, and to help you with this, I do have uh, like a handout available on the side if you've not already picked one up. Um, and then afterwards, I have uh, another, another um, uh, principle, the, the ICF, that I will also try to cover. Can I just ask you to put your hands up if you've come across the ICF, as in the International Classification of Functioning Disability and Health? Okay, so there's uh, a few of you, and there's going to be a little bit more about it later on this afternoon. But we'll try to get to the basics, well, the, the, some of the basics, a little bit of the nitty gritty, and then try to put it into context between the two. And um, we'll see if this works. So um, this presentation, um, I, I plan to talk a little bit about physical literacy. Um, I will introduce the ICF. I'll talk about the core set. How many familiar, people are familiar with the core set? F yeah, a few of you. Um, and then we'll tr try to wrap up with the two concepts together. I'd just like to highlight, uh, is this going to break? Yeah. Okay, this is where we're based in New Vascular, and this is about three hours of the distance. And it's quite a nice graph of Finland because it just shows the distribution of the population. Uh, you can see that a lot of people around in the south, and although geographically, this is not the centre. Uh, it's considered centre, fin central Finland, Keski Swarmi. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's where we're based. So please, you're all welcome to, to come and visit us at some point or another, if, you, if you'd like to. Um, OK, so uh, what do we know about physical literacy, first of all? Um, anybody know physical literacy? Are you part of this? 83% uh, that don't know um, physical literacy. Okay, and you're Canadian as well, right? Okay, <laughs> okay. I, I, it seems that these were the only people that looked upon it in Canada. Now, Canada have embraced this term physical literacy, and so that's why they were able to ask if Canadians knew about this. But it's also popular in the UK, and it's popular in, in, in Australia, and, and spreading around, around the world. And this is the book by, edited by Margaret Whitehead, who is the key, key um, uh, philosopher behind this concept here. Now, the idea of literacy is, in terms of education, we, we all understand literacy is, is an important component in terms of education. We also understand that numeracy is an important component of education. When you go to school, you know, two main things that you want to say is to be able to write and be able to read numbers. Okay? And so we co combine th this concept from Margaret Whitehead is that you also need to be physically literate as well. That you, you also need to have these basic skills to be able to move, uh, move freely. And there's, and there's justifiable cause to actually say that uh, this is also important in schools, but also throughout the life, life course as well. So, uh, so this, is, this concept has been around since... Uh, well, it was developed in 2001, but there's been some work prior to that, and, and there's lots of benefits from that as well. It's also considered an antecedent to physical activity. So yesterday, uh, it's a pity that Heike is not here. He, was quite, he seems to, to enjoy the conversations about discussions of physical activity and sports, uh, whereas if we look at the term physical literacy, we can see it as an antecedent to physical, physical activity. Uh, this being the literacy, being... being has defined here that it is the motivation, the confidence, the physical competence, knowledge and understanding to value and take responsibility okay, to in for engagement in physical activities for life. So it's throughout the life course from cradle to grave, as, as Margaret Whitehead would, would put it. So this is another way to think about physical activities and what makes physical activity and sport as well. Um, so this would be something that I, I would have loved, loved to have talked with Heike about and see, see from this point of view, is it just all physiology? Because yesterday there was a lot of discussion about physiology and testing um, and, and medicine, of course. So it's, it encompasses 
physical doing. Okay? You've got to be doing something to be physically literate or literate to be doing something. Like reading okay, in literacy and numeracy and counting numbers. You're physically doing. That's one of the main um, parts of it. It's also you need a level of competence to be able to do something with competence for success. And you develop your skills. There's a skill development issue there. Um, it's knowing what to do, how and when to perform. So it's knowing what to do and how, given the circumst certain circumstances, as well as um, when to perform. Now the idea of being, when you read a book, you read it with ease and with flow. And the same with physical literacy, you move with ease and with flow. Okay, and that's also knowing how to do that. I'm, if I need to get up from a chair, I need to know how to do that. If I need to go for a run, I need to know how to do this. Okay, and I also know what are the challenges, going up the hill, downhill, how fast I'm going, etc., etc., etc. And uh, last but not least is this strong motivation for physical activity. We need this motivation, we really need this drive to be able to do this. And instilling this motivation is one of the hardest challenges in this. Finally, it's also a holistic approach, and it's based on these two main philosophical um, points of view. And of course, everyone has their own, own differences in their philosophy in life, and this is, this is what it's been based on. This monism, ontology, and this phenomenological epistemology. Uh, two quite, quite big words, but uh, we'll just go through it very, very quickly. In terms of monism, Okay, so we see here on the right they have dualism. It's come from very, very old, old philosophy and um, from as far as Plato saying that the mind and soul and consciousness is one thing and then your body matter was another thing and your mind would control your body, okay, in a certain, certain respect. Um, but they're disconnected, okay. So your mind might be thinking about one thing and it will be disconnected. So this has brought up quite an interesting conversation and debate about whether this is really true. And in the health, uh, under the uh, American Asso Psychology Association and the health psychology department, they've actually decided that they want to put themselves thinking more in terms of monism. Okay, and here we see this picture here of the brain and, and body encompassing as one. Okay, and this kind of over, uh, philosophically, it's, it's like a, a debate, but it's also something that um, uh, kind of breaks this Descartesian rule of, of separation between a mind and body. So what I'd like to do, I'm gonna, if I could give you two to three minutes in your tables just to think about this ontology. Okay, monism, dualism, in terms, of, uh, your, from your background, whether you, which one do you, do you go with? As this is a workshop, I'd like to encourage you to work your mind and shop for ideas. Okay, so uh, if you could, in your tables, just discuss with each other um, about these two ontologies. Um, I'm gonna show you this other picture here. This is, you may know what it is. It's a yin yang. Um, and, and it's, it's, it's a concept that uses kind of both as well, in, in one way or another. And we're gonna look at this image much later on as well, but looked in a slightly different way. Um, the next underpinning is this um, quite long, long, two long words. Um, and uh, it's grounded on Merleau-Ponty's work on phenomenology, and epistemology is the way that we know things. So under Merleau-Ponty, um, um, Ponty, sorry, we, we pers it was considered that we perceive the world through our bodies, we are embodied subjects involved in existence. So here we see a child or a baby looking at the mirror. You've got to think about in the mind of the baby of what they see themselves doing. So they see the mirror and they see this is what they are and what they're doing and you get the initial thoughts here. Okay, so this is a very brief, brief kind of point of view. What I would like you to think about, again, in your tables, to think about as you perceive the world through your bodies, if you're a diver and you're preparing yourself to dive, at these three different levels of competencies, okay, one being that you just drop in the water, the other one you're gonna dive and you finish perfectly, and then the other one competency-wise, okay, I'm a little bit better, let's try and do a little twist and then fall into the water. Just think about that in terms of how you think um, you're, you see the world in your choices that you make, 
okay, and how you then become physically literate from this. Okay? So again, in your tables, just to think about these little images on, the ta on there to, to, to think about how, how, how you perceive things. Okay, just something to think about, some fuel for thought, as the saying goes. Um, so, how to become physically literate, uh, according to Margaret Whitehead. Uh, they're now, I saw a paper today, uh, it was a review, and they're, they're now calling it the Whiteheadian school of thought. They even put the e I A N belonging to something like Freudian, you know, Freud said so it's Whiteheadian um, school of thought. Interesting. So, it's fostered through positive experiences and understanding that empower the individual to value purposeful physical. Um, pursuits and accept personal responsibility to seek out opportunities to engage in these as an integral part of their life and to energize and enrich their lives. Okay, so it's making things better, right? So physical literacy also values the capability approach. Now this is where it gets interesting. Okay, so uh, Len Almond, he's formerly from Loughborough University as well, has also said that the central feature of well-being is the ability to achieve valuable functionings, which are beings and doings that people value. Okay, so now let's look at functions, because I like the word function. We look at function, we see functions, we see a paper about transplant recipients, and we see that um, this, this measure, this health-related quality of life measure that's used um, through, through in many, many different kinds of studies, through the SF32, um, we see physical function being one of them. And we see also um, through rehabilitation, this scale here, this um, physical functioning was one of the lowest, okay? And then after rehabilitation, it becomes almost the same as everyone, everything else. So you can see real big influences and changes in physical functioning, okay? And that's not all, I mean, that's from one study. There's another study through rehabilitation. We covered a lot of this yesterday, okay? You see physical functioning, okay, improving from the intervention group and the control group um, that went through this exercise training, whereas the other group, the control group, had, um, had, did not participate in supervised um, exercise training, um, but both of them had some kind of um, discussions and talks with in counselling, just to describe to them. So, so that nullified the effect of, oh, I'm in rehabilitation and I need to do physical activity. One of them had guided support. So we see functioning, it's really, you, you see it, there's no, there's no dispute about that. And, and that's what a lot of the professionals in this room, I believe, will, will see and will, will champion as well, which is fantastic. But there's also quite a lot of other functions in our body as well. We see this whole list of different kind of functions in a body. And, um, and I don't know how, how clear the, the font is on here, but you can see that we've got all these different kinds of organs and functions here, and um, they all have many different purposes that we all can, uh, can, can see uh, and observe and are concerned about when it comes to overall health. Fantastic, okay. But to the everyday person, if we put it in terms of objects, okay, it can be a bit of a mess. Okay, we see here some shapes. This is guiding us to decide what are the different functions. Okay, and we need a way to try to classify them so we can make it meaningful in when we break it down by units. And this is where the ICF can come into place. And by, by combining them, you can then create a structure, a hierarchical structure, and and this again is also something which you'll we'll see that we can see the shapes, they all group in certain ways and that's where we get a classification. And so that's how we built this International Classification of Function, Disability and Health by the WHO after some other steps which took place before that. And we're going to look into that as well in a second. So where does the ICF fit? Okay, ICF, it fits in this um, family of international classifications under the WHO. So you've got ICF and FIC, HUFIC, okay, and we also have ICF, we also have ICD-10, okay, and we also have ICHI. So ICHI is the International Classification of Health Interventions, and ICD-10, International Classification of Disease, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, um, in terms of statistics. And then you have the International Classification of Functioning. And 
We use this in terms of SOAP. We have the structure and function in terms of classification of functions of the body and the activities and participations. Okay. So here we can see again another SOAP, okay, the subjective problem and the objective exam in a lab. And we use this information with the assessment diagnosis from the ICD and then you can plan health interventions. And health interventions is a newer step which is still currently under development. And, um, and while different people, and I think this is where we're all working towards, okay, what are good exercise plans? Okay, what is a good health intervention? If we're talking about overall health, but if we're talking about physical function and phys physical literacy, what are the interventions needed for that? And prescribing that and sharing that information. But yesterday, we also talked about there's a lot of individual differences and there's lots of genetical factors and different kind of, um, uh, different, uh, uh, what is the terminology I'm using? It was, uh, it was a live, um, what was the two types of donors? So you're gonna have to help. What's the, the disease, the, these one and you had, okay, I, well, anyway, it's something about the condition of the donor. Okay, and receiving the donor, the, do the donor to donor organ, you, living donor and disease donor. So those also those kind of conditions as well. So um, that's where we get kind of complications here. Right, let's take a few steps back. ICD-10. Do we know what this is? This has been around for 150 years. Okay. So from the very first version, the 10th version is now when they're producing the 11th version. But it's described, when I talked about physical literacy, we talked, I talked about cradle to grave, okay? And here they put it in a bit more uh, devastating way of from birth to death. And we see the ICD as a form of statistics from the WHO to say, okay, how many people have died because of this? And what can we do about this to prevent them dying from that? Okay, and it became a statistical tool, and we can see all these different classifications of what kind of conditions you've got um, that lead to death. Okay, uh, and it's commonly shared by doctors around the world, and then in different countries, um, from what I've heard, uh, not being a, a medical doctor myself, I, I hear that some other countries use their different kind of coding systems. But generally speaking, around the world, when you share upon this, the ICD is, is the form to, to use. Okay, and that's, uh, that's quite, quite morbid, I would say. Okay. Um, the ICF, on the other hand, we look at function and we look at quality of life and we can start to see that another yin-yang, but slightly different, okay, it has to be a little bit unique, but we see from birth to, from cradle to, to grave, we also see different types of functions and you go through different parts in life. So overall, where does the ICF fit in again? We see it fitting in in this nice type of presentation here. You go from cradle to grave, and you can understand certain diseases and disorders, um, and you also have your functioning in your health to see where you are and what you're doing and how to improve your, your life with perhaps interventions. Okay. So, overall, in, uh, in, in a short way, we can see that it's the health function with the ICF and the philosophy behind it, we have different qualifiers of severities of impairment leading to disability. We also see that we have the environment and the activities that you do, as well as with the person and the body functions and structures, which gives your overall health condition for one regards and your impairments with your limitations and restrictions and this concept called rehab. So there's lots of THs but rehabilitation therapy. So again this is also considered a third wave medicine. Okay you have uh, medical care and then you have a second wave and now we're in this phase of rehabilitation therapy and, and that's what the ICF is trying to do before we get to the next version. Uh, currently, this is what you'll see when you type ICF, WHO, ICF in Google. You'll, you'll see this kind of overall picture here. It can be seen from different angles. It is not 
a top-down model. You can see there are arrows that interact in both ways in all kinds of directions. This can be sidewards, this can be simplified, it can be more complicated. Um, but generally speaking, we have these kind of components. The health condition, okay, which is usually indicated by the ICD. And then you have your body functions and structures, which we'll, I'll talk about in a second. Your activities and participations. Activities are things that you do, and participation is the things that you can do. Uh, so these are two things. And then you've got your contextual factors governed by the environment and your personal factors. These, these could be genetical as well. So uh, what do we use this for? It's used and shared by different um, professions. We see here, this is an example of, um, of someone who, who needed some support for, for speaking. Okay? Um, but of course, this can be any other type of uh, professional that helps with any other kind of function. So for example, the, this specialist may be concerned about these certain areas and the paediatrician could be concerned about these areas, the child psychologist, a psychiatrist, the teacher, the parents, the social worker and the child itself. Okay? And then what about people trying to get people physically active? Okay? Uh, maybe we're looking at uh, the APA specialist here and what are the areas that maybe that they could be interested in as well. So we see all these lists and words, and what do they all, what do they all mean? Okay, before we go into that, I'll, I'll just go into how is the ICF broken down. Um, in terms of the body systems, there are eight chapters. We saw that there are multiple functions here, so each chapter has a different kind of bodily function. There's the mind, and that also works with the pain issues of being able to feel pain. Um, and then uh, you've got your sensory, breathing, your heart, digestive, endocrine, mus musculoskeletal, and your skin. Okay. And then the coding, this is how it looks. So we'll, we'll come into coding in a second. But the coding then is used from function and disabilities, what they call it, under your body functions and structures. You have your body functions, how, what kind of functions your body has. <coughs> and also the structure. So, the, so for example, is um, I'm going to keep it quite simple in terms of if I can see, okay, so that's my function, but can, uh, does my eye actually work? Is my eye structure? I mean, so does my eye actually work in terms of the function, but the structure of the eye may be different, okay? So then we have double coding. You may not have any, any kind of problem with the structure of the eye, but you may not be able to see so well, so that would change on the, on the coding. And then there you have the activities, participation. Again, um, in terms of seeing, then you may be limited with what you can do. Okay? And then the, you also have contextual factors by the environment. So this is, yeah, this is, this is your, your environment, uh, but also your, your friends and family, and then your personal factors. This is an area which is very under-researched, and that we, we need to drive forwards for this in, in a lot more sense. So here's an example of how it's coded. Um, for example, uh, the urinary system. And yeah, OK. So core sets. They've made it easier for people to use for coding. And I've been given five minutes, so I'm, I'm going to go through this a little bit quicker. This is an example of the core set where um, a person would use this core set, and you can look on the internet for core sets, uh, icf-core-sets.org, and, and usually the guide is that when you look at coding and there's instructions for how to code, um, the cutoff is up between one and two in terms of areas of concern. But sometimes it it's, it's depends on your individual needs. And you also have things in terms of the, uh, the, the activities, participations, as well as the environmental factors as well. Um, and so, what does that mean? In terms of transplants recipients, we've seen there's a study that have, has used this core set, which is the uh, ICF cardiopulmonary conditions core set, and we've seen differences between uh, transplant recipients for people who uh, have been, it's been separated into two groups, those with, um, with uh, kidney transplants and then there's the other organ transplants and we see basically with with the with the core sets in terms of 
the limitations or the disabilities, the level of severities of the qualifiers, there are no differences actually between them except for the kidney one, we see the urinary excretory function, um, functions. This is after, uh, it's quite, quite significantly different. Um, and then there was um, uh, no differences between the types of transplants in, in these, these three. Um, so, sorry, kidneys were much reported less limitations. So the other transplants had more limitations, except these four. And there was no difference on these three. Okay, so that, that's, that's what I meant there. So I'll just correct, correct myself there. Um, and then in terms of environmental factors, um, again, significantly less environmental barriers were observed in kidney recipients. And um, these were the ones that were in these areas, in these domains. Um, but the majority of environmental factors involving people, so that's family, friends, health professionals, were coded as facilitators in both groups. So you really need them, they really need them okay, to facilitate their, their work. Okay, so it goes back to the ICF. Okay, what does, it's covered, we have the coding for health condition, body functions, activities, participation, environmental factors, but personal factors is not coded. So what do we need to do? We need to find out from the individual and we have uh, ways of finding this out, perhaps through uh, perceived barriers and facilitators. And, you, and we see in terms of towards physical activity, we have the top barriers, there's a lack of motivation in most um, transplant recipients. Uh, they prefer to spend time doing other activities and there's bad weather, being too fatigued, their health condition, lack of interest. So these are percentages of those that have indicated that these were barriers. And in terms of facilitators, in terms of saying, yeah, okay, uh, it's good to do physical activity, feeling healthy. 96% of them said, you know, they do it because they feel healthy, okay, which is amazing, you know. I don't know what the other 4% were thinking. Um, but wanting to feel better, wanting to improve health, wanted enhanced physical mobility, wanted increased strength, all these wants, wants, wants. Um, and so, um, and knowing the value of increased exercise, there we've got knowledge and we have this physical literacy, knowledge and responsibility. In terms for children, um, so we've got all these codes and everything else, it's quite, uh, it's quite complicated for us people that don't use codes, right? So maybe it's easy to use this method of the ICF. We say, and this has come from, from child health, child care health development, and uh, we change the, the words to F words. And F words meaning also for functioning. And we have function, family, fitness, fun, and friends. And, and of course, because they're children, we also think about the future as well. So that's another way, a simplified version of using the ICF. Okay, so uh, what we can use for physical literacy, you can look at this on the slides. These are certain codes. Maybe we don't need to go into them. Um, some things to consider when you're thinking about discussion points is physical literacy in transport recipients is lacking uh, lack in debate. I mean, had a very interesting point of view in terms of the ontology. Um, it's not an assessment. Interestingly, it's been argued it's not an assessment, but yet then the manual is still, they said they will publish it in 2005, then they later said they will publish it in 2007, and now with 2016, we're still lacking this APA manual. And I think they've, they've gone uh, uh, to do something else. Interventions are underdeveloped, underpinned from the ICF and the ICD. And so what can we do in the future? Use more of the ICF within the family of international classifications for transplant recipients. Uh, use it as a common language to between various individuals. When I mean in that, I mean professionals as well as individuals who are the recipients themselves. And utilize more personal factors to gain insights into the biomedical, genetical factors, and that, which we also talked about yesterday was quite important, and the health behaviors, social, economical, and environmental factors is what something in, uh, that the ICF can really contribute towards. So this is your thing to think about. What is the ICF? There's different ways of thinking the ICF, really empowering and also um, physical literacy. And 
that's something that I would like for us to discuss um, when we get the chance to. Okay. Right, so from there, um, I think, yeah, I, I did have a thank you slide, but it's now, <laughs> it's now but it's Kitos or thank you, so, because, uh, yeah.